Hey, you're listening to Talking Blues here with Joe Felisco, harmonica player expert. Okay, so let's talk about how you first got into the harmonica. I get the impression the harmonica was around all your life, but you didn't really seriously take it up until a certain time in your life. Yeah, that's correct. I was playing a lot of uh, guitar, mostly mostly rock stuff when I was in high school. And when I went to college, I was pursuing a degree in metalworking. Uh, and I found that I could take some music classes and in particular guitar lessons as one of the electives. And, uh, I really thought that would be great. I love playing the guitar and I started studying more music theory at that point and was really working on some, uh, jazz songs and believe it or not, it, it actually kind of overwhelmed me. <laughs> I It was a little too much. So I took a step back from that and really started studying fingerstyle guitar. And it was through the fingerstyle guitar playing that I discovered some ragtime guitar picking and a lot of the stuff that uh, Robert Johnson recorded with an open tuning and slide guitar. And I really thought that that had to be one of the coolest things, uh, being able to pick out a, a bass accompaniment with your thumb and then get all these cool bendy sliding sounds with the high strings. Uh, I, I just thought that was a most magical thing. And it was really listening to blues music that I really started to recognize and hear the sound of the unassuming humble harmonica. And, and I just um, kind of became completely intoxicated by the sound of the harmonica. Like how, how could something so small and boring looking do such a fantastic job in the blues music world. And, and so once I started playing and studying some of the recordings, I just found that I had so many questions and found that many people didn't know. They just didn't really have answers for how the thing plays what causes notes to bend on the harmonica, all these mysteries, just, you know, people could do it, but they couldn't explain it. And, and that definitely sent me down the path of trying to find answers to many of those questions and really only made my love of blues. And of course, uh, the role of the harmonica in blues, it only made me love it all the more. So what, what happened to your guitar playing? Did it just get thrown to the wayside and, and the total focus is on the harmonica? Um, it, I didn't progress too much more as a guitar player until the last couple years. I Maybe the last two years since the pandemic lockdown, I started playing a lot more guitar with the... Uh, idea in mind that I really wanted to uh, support myself, accompany myself more as a singer and playing the harmonica in the rack. So my, my guitar playing has progressed in the last couple years. But previous to that, I would say that I mostly just focused on guitar playing to accompany students. So I could have a workshop bring an acoustic guitar in, have people play for me uh, while I was accompanying them and pretty quickly be able to size up uh, what their skill set was and what their shortcomings were as a player. 
uh, just being able to accompany them with basic, but I think fairly solid rhythm playing. So if we go back, I know that you grew up and I think there were harmonicas where you grew up and you picked them up every so often, but it never really connected with you. That's correct. I wonder at what point, I mean, what do you think it was at that point that you, it all suddenly became something that you were totally connected to as opposed to the many years before when you picked it up and it wasn't something that you loved? I would say the ma one of the real magic moments, uh, well, I would say there's a couple. One of them was when I was in college, I was part of a guitar ensemble. We called ourselves the Wolfpack Guitar Ensemble. And one of the guys actually played some blues harmonica in one of the songs. And it really gave me some exposure to it and got me intrigued by it. But I think it was probably when I seen the opening credits for the movie Crossroads with Sonny Terry playing, doing this sort of thing. That sort of thing that it just lit a fire under me. And I thought, I, I that is, that is so powerful what's going on there in that song, uh, the way that he played, um, that I, I had to, I had to do it. I had to dig in and try to make sense out of it. So, <laughs> um, that, that movie has been mentioned by many people, um, as, as to connecting them with the blues. What, what did you hope to get out of the machine tool technology schooling that you got? Like, what were you hoping that would lead you. Well, to. I was out of high school and I just needed to do something as opposed to uh, get a job right away. Uh, one of the wise things that I got from my father was he said, do stuff, try to not work for as long as you can. You're going to be working for the rest of your life. Go experience things and do things and and go to school as long as you can. And that, that seemed good enough for me. So the education that I got in, in college, being a machinist metal worker, did uh, set me down a path uh, for what later would turn into the harmonica rebuilding and customizing stuff that I've uh, made a name for myself. Uh, it's always, well, actually at times it was a full-time business. I think for maybe as much as 20 years, it could have been uh, near of a full-time business. Uh, but I've really tried to spread myself out, you know, and do teaching and, and study history and become a player uh, and doing the harmonica work. So the machinist skills that I got going to uh, the junior college certainly turned out to be very helpful to me. And you also did some guitar building, did you not? Uh, there was a time before I was really working on harmonicas that I would say I was doing basic harm, uh, guitar repairs and guitar setups. I, I would say it was very simple stuff. Okay, so you, you mentioned that you do the teaching. You also um, maintain and, and build, I don't know if it's building harmonicas, but you certainly customize and maintain harmonicas, and you play. So you hear the sound watching the beginning of Crossroads, and you think, I need to learn that. So the first thing is to learn the harmonica. And the, at the, go the goal of that time is to learn the harmonica and become a player? Uh, I did not have it that well thought out. I... I it was, I was overcome with a white hot curiosity about it. It was something that I just could not shake. And the more that I dug in and tried to find people and ask questions, the more convinced that I became that there's not a lot of people that understand and know, uh, much about this they you know people can do it but they just don't know how to explain it or they don't know how to teach it and it really only fueled my curiosity and my passion 
for it. And, and I, I'm, I guess I'm extreme enough that if I want to learn about something that I go right to the razor's edge of where it's, where it's the most sharp. So as early as 1990, I went to this international uh, harmonica event and I really got to meet a lot of players uh, that were uh, on the cutting edge of what was going on. And then in 1993, I went to a harmonica event that was truly international in the Honer hometown of Trossing in Germany. And I met many connections that would uh, later prove to enable me to have a career in music uh, in Europe, in Western Europe, touring there with uh, Eric Noden. I wonder, in the early 1990s, what, how good were you as a player? I progressed very rapidly as a player. Uh, I practiced a lot. I studied a very wide range of harmonica recordings. I, I think this is one of the things that set me apart as a player that I didn't just study blues. I studied uh, Chicago blues, but I studied Chicago blues by the Sonny Boys and the Walters and even earlier recordings of blues. So a lot of the early styles uh, of blues harmonica playing going back to the 1920s are a bit more groove oriented and a bit more chord oriented. So I think studying many of these pre-war styles like the harmonica train imitations and the fox chase pieces and the lost John pieces and just working at them with extreme determination really helped uh, me to develop a skill set. Uh, whereas I really learned to use the tongue blocking technique in extreme ways. And I really learned to develop uh, breathing skills that I think really took me quite a few years to kind of reverse engineer and really figure out, oh, that's why I can do that and other people can't because I've really learned to breathe in a very different way. Um, you know, when you sing, you take an inhale breath and then you're making music vocalizing on that exhaling breath. Well, on the harmonica, uh, of course, you can make sounds inhaling and exhaling, but the majority of the sounds on the harmonica that people really like are really fascinated with that get goosebumps from hearing are sounds mainly inhaling. And if you're making sounds mainly inhaling, you, you have to learn to breathe differently with a new sense of breath control. Harmonica is one of those instruments that you can't just watch and learn. Yes. And at that point, there probably was no videos to watch. How do you learn that? How did you learn all that? Uh, <laughs> well, I really just kept going back to the greatest recordings by the greatest players ever lit that ever lived in reviewing them in great detail and comparing what I'm hearing to what I am able to do. And through time, I was able to really understand that what makes those early recordings so special is what I refer to as layers. Uh, you could 
it would be fair to say that if you listen to a player like Sonny Terry or Sonny Boy Williamson, number one, that you could define what you're hearing as a melody, but there's also other stuff going on that doesn't, there's not really words in the normal music world that describe these other things that are happening that are going on. So you have a layer that's a melody. You have a layer that might be a, a harmony, a lower note in octave apart. You have percussive driving sounds that accent the note or the octave that is going on. You also have a phenomenon that is heard in the harmonica playing world world that I refer to as dirt. That is playing a melody, but a fraction of an adjacent hole on the harmonica that gives that melody a like smoky quality. It gives it a surrounding of additional sound that decorates, makes that melody note thicker and fatter and gives it more sound. And in addition to those things, you also have chord chord playing going on behind it that often drives it or gives it a rhythmic bounce in the playing. So it, if you're listening to classic great harmonica playing and you're only listening to the melody and only listening for the melody, that would be like listening to a piano player and only listening to what he's doing with one finger, you know? So there's obviously if a piano player is sitting down, he's going to be using, he or she's going to be using all 10 fingers probably on both hands. And this is where the tongue comes into play as a harmonica player. You can use the tongue to, of course, play a clean melody, play octaves or intervals, get explosive percussive rhythmic sounds, or giving you instant access to chords on the harmonica. And when you listen to many of these early players, especially players from the mid-1960s and earlier, you generally do hear all these layers of sound that are going on. And that's just what makes it really fascinating to me, that an instrument that you would think is so simple has got all these hidden layers of things going on. Can I ask you, in your early days, when you were trying to, when you were obsessed about learning the harmonica, was, can you share with me a moment where something happened, where you figured out something and that became a huge milestone for you? Um, I can tell you a fantastic moment. I was trying to make sense out of Sonny Terry, one of the most misunderstood, enigmatic players, uh, possibly the greatest diatonic harmonica player that ever lived because of all the unique contributions that he brought. Uh, he could be a fantastic accompanist or he could wow and blow the minds of an audience just by himself with his harmonica. Um, I was trying to make sense out of some of his unaccompanied solo harmonica playing, his whooping, hooting the blues type of pieces. And I had an epiphany that shocked me. And that was that Sonny Terry actually was the player that totally blurred the line between chords, octaves, intervals, and clean single notes. He could, he could get any degree of a clean single note and blur it all the way into his chord playing. And, and it, it suddenly made me realize that the mountain of Sonny Terry that I was trying to climb 
was just way higher than I thought it was. It, it, I wanted to be able to put him into this nice little neat symbol box, but I realized that it was not possible. There was way more going on in his playing than I had ever anticipated. Uh, and it really, yeah, it, it just shocked me. I, I, I think, I think I came like to the stage one of having a little bit of a nervous breakdown because, (laughs) because of how humbling it was to think that I was really onto something and, and really knew what, which end was up. And I realized that he had way more going on than I had anticipated. So one of my favorite players, so a lot of complexity going on in what he did, Sonny Terry. So many years later, do you find yourself now, can you figure out everything, all of that? And are you able to replicate what he was doing? I believe that I can replicate 98, 99% of what he's doing. There's always this little element, you know, of mystery that's going on. Uh, This past year, uh, I was participating in an online workshop with uh, Dennis Grunling, and we went into a lot of detail about Sonny Terry. And it, it enabled me to go back and listen again with fresh ears to everything that I was confident I could do and not so confident I can do. And, and then the few things that puzzled me and, and I was happy to say that I could up my game a little bit more uh, imitating what it was that he was doing in terms of his sound and notes and chords and rhythmic grooves. Uh, And that was very exciting. I, I was really happy to, you know, get to that slightly higher level in, in replicating his sounds and style. When you started learning and pursuing the knowledge of harmonica, was, was the first thing about all about learning to play? Because I know you, you go into the mechanics of a harmonica and to not rebuild, but customize the harmonica and your machinist tool background I presume helped that, but what was the focus? Was it about playing and becoming a performer or was it about being somebody who's an authority on harmonicas or was it becoming a teacher? Uh, it was about playing first and foremost. When, when I got to a place with my playing where I had a fairly high degree of confidence and then a little bit of the excitement was starting to go away, then that was when I be, uh, pursued performing uh, because taking it in front of an audience really is, uh, you know, the ultimate test of whether you can do it or not. Um, but it, it was about playing. And the thing that I want to do want to bring this back to is that the role of the harmonica in blues music is really very, very special. You could make an argument that the harmonica can make music in any genre of music, but no genre other than blues has embraced the role of the harmonica so open and with such, uh, so uncompromisingly. And I think you really hear that with Sonny Boy One and Sonny Terry, who both first started to record in 1937. And and then it was just really no uh, turning back. In the early 1950s, uh, it really got bumped up another higher level uh, with the role of the harmonica when uh, Chicago blues actually became kind of a uh, pop music for a number of years and the harmonica became amplified. Uh, l- what little Walter did is really just mind blowing. He, what he did as an accompanist, what he did as a front man and what he did as a solo instrumentalist uh, in the 1950s is just just staggering. You know, you would who would have ever thought that the harmonica 
could sound so magical and so exciting in blues music. And it's my feeling that what he did and what a few other players did at that time was so phenomenal that it's, it's a tremendous challenge just trying to equal it. I don't know that it can be surpassed uh, what it was that he was doing. That That's my opinion uh, of the role of the harmonica in you know, 19, the 1950s and you know, what it did for, did in blues and for blues. I wonder, being around Chicago, <clears throat> was were there players that you looked up to who, who you could talk to um, and who would openly give you tips on how to play? I, I don't know. How, I get the impression that harmonica players today are, are more free and um, are willing to share their knowledge, but I don't know if that's always been the case. And if you went up to some Chicago blues harmonica player and said, hey, how do you do that? If they were open to share that knowledge with you. Uh I have experienced the uh, full spectrum uh, of of players that are some just delighted to be as helpful, helping as possible to deliberately, in my opinion, telling you things that were not true just because maybe they felt threatened by uh, my my inquiries mm -hmm. so it in keep in mind that because of such a lack of visuals that you know very often it it was easier and more rewarding just to try to figure it out to the best of my ability on my own than to uh talk with somebody that you know was going to give you misinformation or just not have any ability to articulate what it was that they were doing. I mean, that's very common, also very common. And you said one of your strengths was to be able to articulate things like that. At what point did you decide teaching was something that was very important to you? Uh, I started uh, trying to uh, teach probably in the late 80s, very early 90s, and it had occurred to me that the there was a school on the north side of Chicago, the Old Town School of Folk Music, and that was the most happening place in the whole Chicago land area for teaching. And I just went in and said, I'm a harmonica player and I'm full of excitement and enthusiasm and you should hire me to teach here. And <laughs> they did. <laughs> just like that. Yeah, really. <laughs> and at this point, do you have a name as a player? Like, were you a known quantity, an entity in, in the blues harmonica world? I, no, I don't think I was. Uh, I really wasn't uh, playing out at that time. Uh, but, I mean, I had, either you can do it or you can't. I mean, I, I clearly had a skill set impressive enough that they, you know, they did hire me and I had a list, a clientele of professional players um, already from around the country at that point in time that was, you know, hard to be dismissive of, you know, I, I knew players and I was getting stuff done and, but it was really there that I kind of said, I need to develop a curriculum. And if I'm in Chicago, then it makes the most sense to have a curriculum of how to play Chicago blues. And it really was clear that Chicago blues, in my opinion, was really the harmonica style that was the result of using your tongue in a skillful way to play all those layers that I was speaking of. And I, I, it's just, it took a long time of listening and trying to break stuff down and try to figure out, you know, things that maybe I thought were easy that were very advanced and 
things that I didn't really acknowledge that were the perfect things that a beginning player should be working on to develop fundamentals. Something like tongue blocking. I can't imagine how easy it is to explain that process to a student. Well, it's... So if you focus on the fact that you can't see what's going on, it can be overwhelming for some people. That's for sure. Uh, because our society is so visually or oriented. We're such visual learners. So, but what I have to do is I have to say, all right, you got a tongue, right? Stick it out. Stick your tongue out. There. So if you can stick your tongue out, then you already have the main skills that are required <laughs> to using tongue blocking when you're playing the harmonica. Now, stick your tongue out and now move it to your left. Now, now you have the majority of all the skills that you could need. Now, if you can stick your tongue out, move it to the left, and then move it to the right. Now you are already uh, <laughs> mimicking advanced skills that you'll need as a harmonica player. So, you know, if you start with, with it from that kind of way, then people are more like, oh, okay, I guess it's, uh, you know, not that difficult. It's not that overwhelming, but, but, but you have to just sort of dive in and uh, get, have that breakthrough that if you have a tongue, then you can tongue block. And if you can put your tongue and touch the harmonica while you're playing and lick, lick it rhythmically, then you have about all that you need to <laughs> become accomplished. The rest of it is just coordination that takes time. So at the same time, you, you're focusing on becoming more of a performer and, and establishing a name for yourself. Did you have goals as to what you wanted to accomplish as a player? Well, that's interesting you ask. I appreciate that. Um, I've always been deeply intrigued with solo, unaccompanied playing. And I had a, a big breakthrough uh, in the year 2001 when I was invited to participate in a world harmonica festival in Germany. And what had happened is they asked me to do some workshops on playing, but one of the headlining players uh, backed out and said that he couldn't do it. And then they asked me, um, look, you're going to be here. Do you want to just get, take this performer spot. Now I had like six months to prepare and I said, uh, yeah, I, how would I, how could I turn down an opportunity like this? So it was a, uh, a featured spot on the evening concert. I only played for 20 minutes, but I played solo unaccompanied harmonica uh, you know, Fox Chase, Sonny Terry, Whoopin, Train Imitation, uh, D. Ford Bailey style piece, Sonny Boy Williamson, Bye Bye Bird style playing. And that was stuff that I was really uh, excited about. You know, what can one person with only a harmonica do to intrigue an audience? So that was something... And even to this day, I am very, very intrigued by that. And that, that really goes back to what I was saying about Sonny Terry being able to wow, mesmerize an audience with his pyrotechnics all by himself and a player like D. Ford Bailey, who was heard for years on the Grand Old Opry over the radio, you know, that sort of playing. But that's very different than what Chicago blues is. Uh, I just really fell in love with Chicago blues, of course, being in Chicago and trying to, to figure out how to teach it. And I did play in a blues band doing traditional or fairly traditional stuff for a number of years. And actually in 2003, I had the opportunity to do something with uh, Chicago 
player, guitar player, and fine harmonica player, Eric Noden. And he asked me about, you know, do you want to do this blues in the school thing? And I said, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and we really found that we had chemistry and continued to do more and more shows together. Now, if you look at the role of the harmonica in Chicago blues, all the guys that are doing that, um, whether, you know, uh, Kim Wilson, Billy Branch, Mark Hummel, um, Sugar Ray, Jim Liban. When you look at guys that are doing that, they have kind of a formula that they use. They kind of do a little bit recreation of Little Walter. They got some big Walter Horton things. They have to have some Jimmy Reed things. They do some Sonny Boy 2 Rice Miller things. They're maybe doing some Junior Wells, maybe doing some James Cotton, you know. So they have this formula where they're recreating all these uh, famous post-war players. Um, some maybe weren't from Chicago, like Slim Harpo. Or pretty much everybody is doing some re recreation of Slim Harpo. But they were all the, those cats making uh, records in the 50s and 60s. So what I and Eric Noden have been doing are trying to recreate players from the earlier decades, from the 20s, 30s, and 1940s. So we're doing Sonny Terry Brownie McGee recreation. We're doing Sonny Boy One Big Joe Williams recreation. Sonny Boy One Big Bill Brunzi recreation. Uh, we're doing Fred McDowell and Johnny Woods recreation. You know, players that maybe maybe they did record later, but they were not Chicago style players. They were definitely rural uh, players. And, and so that's kind of been our quest. Uh, I just, we love doing it, you know? So, uh, and we've only continued to refine that and sort of begin to venture into uh, coming up with something that maybe represents what our own individual styles are. Uh, many people will get into blues and they might say, well, you should pursue your own style. And that might be fine for some people, but uh, Eric and I both feel like, yeah, having our own style is cool, but it's also really cool and really rewarding to uh, be able to recreate many other people's styles. So that makes the listening experience a lot more rewarding because then things don't become quite so predictable. But I presume it's very difficult to, to create your own style in any instrument. Well, I'm not going to argue about that point for sure. Um, yeah. Um, and I do think that very often, my style, if you really find a song and say, Joe Felisco, that's your style, I would probably have to say, well, maybe, but listen to that. You can hear Big Walter in that and and listen to that going on there. You clearly hear, you know, Sonny Boy 2 in that part of it. So, I, I mean, I know where I've gotten my inspiration for the very various facets of my playing style. So you, you mentioned D4 Bailey as yeah. one of the players, somebody who I believe you you have studied and look up to a great deal. And if I'm not mistaken, you were involved in his induction into the Hall of Fame. Tell me about that. I was given a copy of the Yazoo record harmonica blues of the 1920s and 1930s. And it has a absolutely f fabulous cross section of players from 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, maybe there's nothing from the 40s, 20s, and 30s. And 
one of the cuts on there was D Ford Bailey doing Davidson County blues. And I guess initially I probably thought that it was a chromatic harmonica. It sounded so exotic and magical that, it certainly could not be recreated on the simple diatonic harmonica. But as I played more and developed more skills, I realized, yes, indeed, it w- was done on a diatonic harmonica. And in that world that I was mentioning that I'm fascinated with, which is how can one uh, captivate in entertain an audience with just a harmonica and voice, uh, there are the groove parts of that, which are train imitations, which are Lost John Fox Chase pieces. And there's another category of which I sort of refer to as melody playing. And, And D Ford Bailey really, you know, nails that. He was definitely one of the greatest harmonica players that could play a melody and decorate it continuously through the three minutes in a way that he was always surprising you with that. And so I just really have tried for years to understand the method behind that kind of melody playing. It's probably the part about D Ford Bailey, which makes him more of an old time player and less of a blues player, um, that sort of thing. But, but D Ford had a really special tonal quality in his playing where I like hear him make going from an EU EU in, in having the attack sound like he's doing it, with a closed lip B sound, that kind of attack, which I feel like I still can't quite get how beautiful his tonal attack is on the bottom low end of the harmonica. So he's doing all that stuff and creating a rhythm. You know, there's all those layers, melody, rhythm going on, harmony, going on and all this creative improv going on with how he changes the tone of the notes. Uh, Sonny Terry did that also. But what did it mean to you to actually be part of that Hall of Fame induction for him? Oh, well, uh, I was tremendously honored that David Morton the gentleman that really did the biography on D Ford Bailey uh, thought uh, me being the worthy one to go there and, and represent D Ford Bailey playing the Fox chase. Um, I just was tremendously honored and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm speechless. That's, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> um, okay. So the other thing that you do is to work on harmonicas for, I guess yourself and many other musicians to customize it to that type of playing. How did that come about? I've always predominantly been self-employed. So I've always been looking for creative little ways to make some money and do it in a way that relates to what I'm interested in and what I'm intrigued in. So initially it started out as doing harmonica repairs or alternate different harmonica tunings, you know, doing a little bit basic work. Um, I am honored that one of the tunings that I was experimenting with in, you know, 1990 was taken up by Corky Siegel, who wrote a song called Felisco's Dream uh, using one of the alternate tunings. And so I would meet players in that kind of context and try to understand by working with them, networking with them, communicating with them, what is it that you want in a harmonica and just trying to understand, you know, what the needs are of a player. 
uh, asking as many questions as I can, trying to learn as much as possible. Um, in the early 1990s, there was a crisis in the harmonica world that the new harmonicas that were coming off the assembly line were horrible. They were really the least responsive harmonicas that I think that have ever been sold. And this was an opportunity for me to really learn uh, more about the harmonica and learn more about how can I make a harmonica play better. So when I use the word responsive, what I mean is that it's a, you could liken it to a guitar. If the action of the guitar strings is very high, it's going to be very difficult to play. There will be a benefit that you can play it very hard and loud, but it's going to be really a struggle to play. So when you, when I use the word responsive, speaking of a harmonica, it just means how much air does it take to get the reeds to sound, to get sound to come out. And ideally, you want to have a situation where you're getting a lot of sound with the least amount of air. And I think that's the simplest way that I can explain what the magic is that I learned to impart to harmonicas to make them more playable. So that really turned into a business and a service where I will do work for players like uh, Rick Estrin or Kim Wilson, for example. And, you know, what they get from me is very, very consistent in terms of its responsiveness and in terms of its in-tuneness. Um, when I was saying that I initially would talk to players and say, what is it you want? What kind of, what do you want with a harmonica? I really ran into a number of people that admitted they had a situation where the, and a, the owner of a music store might let them go in in the back and, and play all the new harmonicas that came in and, and pick the ones that they thought were the best, you know, and I was starting to find that it was, I would hear numbers that players would play 10 harmonicas and then find two that really worked to their liking. And so I, what I've done is really tried to make that 10 out of 10 uh, in terms of the harmonica business. And of course, as I progressed as a player, then I would know definitely this is what somebody is going to want if they're playing Chicago blues. Uh, this is the chords are beautifully in tune. All the octaves and intervals are beautifully in tune and the notes uh, themselves sound right. So I just learned that a, a high end concert style Steinway piano for the concert stage has a lifespan of about, eight to 12 years at its highest level. And then wow. they have to kind of, it's still playable and it's still really good, but for the very high elite classical musicians, it's, you know, 15 years into it, it's not good enough. What is, what is the lifespan of a harmonica? Uh, that varies from player to player. Uh, you could compare a harmonica to like guitar strings, whereas uh, there are guitar players that change the guitar strings after one or two performances. And there are others that, you know, have the guitar strings playing for months. I can confirm that the uh, many of the players, the professional players that I do work for and myself uh, with, with normal playing that is not abusive and, uh, carefully and consistently removing the saliva after a performance, a harmonica can all, also last for years. Yes. Oh, okay. That wasn't the impression I had. So, yeah. um, but okay. So when, when the harmonicas were made lesser in quality in the nineties, that, that drew you more to fixing these things, has that improved at all? Like what is the state of the harmonica business today? I am happy to say that the, 
they have improved quite noticeably. Uh, you can go and buy a uh, marine band style harmonica, and it is really uh, good for most professional players. I'm really, really happy about that because it was really depressing for years to be trying to get people to play when I could tell that part of the problem is they're fighting with a harmonica that is uh, giving them resistance. It's not making it easy. It's making it difficult in fighting with them. So the, the quality definitely has improved since that time period in the early mid 1990s. It's great. And, and how do you feel about the players out there today? Um, I presume there's still a lot of good players out there. And I don't mean just the pros, but people who come to you and say, I want to learn how to play the harmonica, teach me. Are you, are you encouraged by what you're seeing in the harmonica world of, of the students out there who are encouraged by it? Or does it worry you? Um, I don't have any worries about it whatsoever. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm. I would say that the way that in the blues world, the way that I see things is that you have a, a faction of players that are more interested in the tradition that I believe Paul Butterfield started in the mid 1960s. And that's more a tradition of clean single notes. So they treat the harmonica a little bit more like uh you know, uh, alto saxophone or something. It's more about clean single note playing. Whereas uh, I see myself more on the other extreme, which is trying to get the biggest sound out of the harmonica possible in trying to figure out how to tastefully play the maximum number of chords. That to me is really what the definition of Chicago blues and traditional harmonica playing is. And that approach, I think, fits better for being a sideman and an accompanist, an accompanist uh, playing the harmonica. Uh, of course, if you're a harmonica playing singer, then you don't have as many or as much of an opportunity to be an accompanist. Uh, and that's one of the sad things about the evolution of blues is that it does seem like the harmonica playing sideman is becoming less and less important. And it seems like, you know, if you, you're hearing harmonica in blues, it's probably coming from the singer playing a little bit of harmonica. Uh, you don't hear as much uh, harmonica as a, a company, a sideband in blues. Um, I don't know if this is a fair question, but if I was to ask you with all the knowledge you have about the harmonica players, who out there, young harmonica players, should people listen to? Young players? How young? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Like more of the up-and-comers as opposed to established artists. Uh, are there people out there that you, you were blown away by? Yeah, there is. But um, if I was going to like name drop that, that's a little bit tricky for me. Again, my what I like is more of about sound. Uh, I'm, some people would argue that blues is about notes. And I would say, yeah, sure, it's about notes, but it's about making those notes sound special. Blues can also be about getting a sound out of your instrument. And players that really come to mind that I think are uh, young, younger players are like Victor Puertes from Spain, uh, Stephen Trock from Belgium, um, Gareth Tucker in the UK, uh, comes to mind it's just being a you know fabulous younger player whereas uh, the sound getting a sound is a clearly a very important thing interesting that you mentioned 
people from the European countries. Any thoughts on that? I know you've played there a lot. Is it that that there's more of um intrigue to North American music over there? Um well, my totally not reading that correctly. I no, I I just I think that the opportunities are a little more plentiful in Western Europe as a harmonica playing musician than they are here in the United States. Interesting. Um, my final question to you: Tell me, do you have do you still have goals? And if so, what are they? My goals are to uh, move more into the online teaching, doing as much as I can online uh, in terms of uh, the, the workshops that I'm creating with Eric Noden and the blues harmonica etudes study songs that I'm creating in my online store. Uh, FaliscoStore.com and really continuing to develop on the same path that we've been on for 20 years uh, with Eric Noden, really trying to develop online groove workshops and online concerts, which are all available at our joint uh, website, which is RootsDuo.com. Um, definitely want to continue to develop those things as much as possible. Well, Joe, thank you so much for taking this time. Um, I know you're a very respected player, and I've heard your name many, many times, so it's been a thrill just getting to know you a little bit. It's a delight. It was a delight for me to talk with you and share my passion and enthusiasm, and I would have to say that you are one of the very best interviewers that I've ever encountered, uh, ever. So thank you for making this so rewarding and asking the right questions. Oh, you're too kind, but thank you so much. It's truly an honor. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.